Hello. So as I have been going through the Unbelievable podcasts, um, I need to put my cards on the table. Um, or I should say Unbelievable Big Conversations. I need to put my cards on the table about a little bit of a struggle I've been having with them. And that is that I have found that the naturalists are not being challenged on, nor are they addressing issues with relativism. And I mean relativism in the broadest sense, not just in ethics, although that's a huge deal. Um, I don't believe any, this is a conspiracy or anything absurd like that. I just think that the conversations aren't heading that way. So I thought, well, I'd like to see maybe, well, and I'll just be honest with you. Some, I won't name any of them, but they've really disappointed me. I know it sounds kind of weird as a theist being disappointed that atheists aren't destroying your worldview, but one, I don't believe that they have what it takes to do that. But number two, um, I like a challenge just as much as they like a challenge. Um, I think they like a good debate and I like a good debate. And I'm sitting here watching these people and many of them, to be honest with you, maybe make really good scholars in some sense, but they really are not, quote unquote, bringing the goods when it comes to combating other, their their opponents in terms of worldview. This I don't believe it's true for all naturalists. It's just the ones I'm seeing on the big conversation. They're not getting the job done. And I'm not, it's not supposed to be their job. I don't think they're setting out. I didn't mean to go into all this too much, but I want to talk about it a little bit sort of as a analysis of what's going on with the unbelievable stuff. I, I don't believe they set out to even do that. They just have a particular subject and they're dealing with it, but there's too many things going on in the background of a worldview that needs to be challenged to fully understand ultimately why some elements of the views are not accepted by the theist, okay? And so I'm just watching them and uh, several of them, I can think of three off the top of my head, the one I'm going over right now. I just can't believe how not only inadequate some of these naturalists are to defend their positions, but almost how ignorant they are of what it means to be a naturalist. And it's it's quite surprising. So I wanted to turn to one of the big guns. And there's Sean Carroll would be one of those guys. Quentin Smith would be a big gun. Somebody who just really can defend their position and really is a thinker. And I thought, Graham Oppy, I remember hearing... Um, William Lane Craig one time was asked um, who does he think some of the best defenders of naturalism are, and Graham Oppy was the first one. And I was like, okay, I, I want to look into this guy, and yeah, he's impressive. This guy's a thinker. Just a straight-up thinker. And I, I loved every second I've had of studying this guy. Now, I am trying not to make this a focus on the debate the debates that I'm going to watch him in. I am going to watch him primarily in debates. And the only reason I'm going to be doing that is I want to see him actually defend naturalism. If you're not aware of what naturalism is, all naturalism basically is, is just that, that the way you understand reality is that which has, ex possesses extension. And what extension is, is just that it has a physical presence. And that would be the best way to explain what qualifies as real. And that, of course, carries over. And, of course, it would mean that there's no God uh, and, and that the world, quote-unquote, is synonymous with the universe or multiverse, depending on, on what naturalist, what they would believe, the, whatever naturalist you're dealing with. So I thought um, it'd be interesting to study Graham Oppie this way. So I'm going to break down first a debate he had with William Lane Craig, but I'm going to cover two more debates he had. And I'm going to try to get through this all through um, my difficulties at work right now. And so try to just do this as much as I can. And then I'll come back to the unbelievable stuff um, after the, after, you know, the new year, hopefully. So um, now let's get into this th particular thing. Now they were debating uh, the applicability of mathematics. And that is, that there seems to be an 
odd connection, particularly for the naturalist. This is a very strange connection between math and the physical universe that can't be fully explained. Now, they're not talking about uh, balancing your checkbook and having enough cash to pay for something. That's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is when you get into these more extreme parts of math. Eventually, you can explore the universe, the physical universe, with just math. Why should we expect mathematics, which apparently is disembodied, right? There, there wouldn't be any um, reason to believe that there are mathematical artifacts that exist if you're a naturalist, they certainly don't because they don't possess extension, which we've discussed. So why would one expect them to have causal power? Well, you wouldn't, right? They don't cause things to exist. Math wouldn't doesn't do that. All right, so since math can't cause things to exist, then why would you expect to be able to make grand discoveries about the nature of the universe, which are later confirmed physically? Why would you expect that to happen? You wouldn't. You wouldn't expect that to happen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover three parts of this debate. Now, the first part of the debate um, was um, dealing with beauty, aesthetics. And it was an article by a guy named, uh, I think, uh, Vigner. And he really felt that aesthetics explained... He felt that aesthetic drive, the drive for mathematical beauty, was what fueled much of what mathematicians did and do. And Graham Oppie doesn't like this. He doesn't think that's the case. He believes that it's more likely that um, it's, it's more the case that mathematicians are trying to solve problems. And then he says a lot of times they have to go into the complex numerical plane. Now what he means by that is this, you have what's called imaginary numbers, and then you have real numbers. And imaginary numbers are a way in which you can do math, um, and then real numbers, and then you can use, you can combine imaginary numbers and real numbers and make complex numbers. I'm not gonna go into a bunch of explanation on that because this video is already gonna be long enough as it is. And what he's saying is you have to do that to solve problems. And it, he says what you end up with is a resolution in the end. And he's like, that's the, by and large, on balance, the major driving force of mathematicians is problem solving. Now this, at first I heard this thought, okay, you know, this guy's a thinker. He, this isn't that big of a deal. The, the entire argument doesn't rise or fall on this. He's just a thinker. But I think Graham Oppie is just a smarter guy than me <laughs> and kind of understood something beyond this argument that's really important. And that is that when you look at, let's take evolution, for example. Um, why we don't need aesthetics to survive. They're not necessary to survive. And in a naturalist system, beauty is a, a chemical response of the, of the brain. It's not an actual thing. And that is a difficult thing to accept. Again, I think Abby's just thinking multiple steps ahead here. Way ahead of me, anyway. Why should there be an element of beauty in being able to explore the universe through mathematics? That's a much bigger concern than I would have initially had considered. For the, for the naturalist, because there appears to be no point to aesthetics and naturalism. Ultimately, if there is one, you can make some conjecture on it and maybe even good conjecture that sounds very plausible, but it's still kind of ultimately a mystery. And I think for, for Oppie, this is a problem. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that it may have been an issue for him to hear that these mathematicians are focused on the beauty as opposed to just solving the problem. And he, I think he feels that 
solving the problem is the drive and therefore that is what's ultimately happening when someone quote unquote does math right if i'm right about oppie's view and he didn't have a lot of time to talk about it so if he were here he may he may correct me on it but if i'm right that the primary drive of mathematicians is problem solving solving uh he's just wrong he's just wrong that is not what primarily he, he well no 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 okay let me back up a little bit he's only partially right we'll say that i think he's partially right still smarter than me but i still think he's only partially right um there's no doubt no one can doubt that what drives a mathematician is problem solving but it still doesn't mean that another part of what drives them is the beauty of math and not only that this drive for beauty is effective in solving these equations and if there's no drive for beauty you will not arrive at answers you'll never get there einstein was uh, you know einstein wasn't sitting in a, a laboratory going think 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 aha yes uh relativity general relativity i got it let's go for that it's not what happened he was working in a government building and he was there was a painter on a scaffolding outside of his building and he looked out and he thought he wasn't in the academic world at this time he was just doing kind of a nine-to-five job for the government and he looked out at the scaffold and he thought what if he fell down right now And he said, let's imagine someone standing on one of the floors and he passes by. It would appear the person standing on one of the floors below that he's passing by very quickly. But how would it look like to the guy who's fall actually falling? Is he experiencing something different than the person standing still on the floor? Kind of interesting. And that led him ultimately to the math. Now, is that problem solving? Of course it's problem solving. No question about it. But there, it, it's, it's not just equations that are driving force behind what gets ultimately results. It was imagination that did that. And I think Vigner, um, Craig said that Vigner kept using the term aesthetic. Craig said he preferred the term a priori, which means prior to. And I think Abby did not like the term aesthetic at all. He just felt that that was outside the realm of, of this. Ultimately, it should have been a much smaller emphasis in Wigner's article. I think what Wigner was talking about was what Einstein was talking about. If you look it up, I didn't have time to look it up before this. There's an Einstein quote where he says, imagination is, is what is required to do great mathematics or something along those lines. If you look at like Stephen King, when he talks about, and this is in other areas, like Stephen King says he doesn't see himself as an author. He, read his book on writing. Highly recommend that book. He doesn't see himself as an author. He sees himself as an architect. I'm not an architect. An archaeologist. He says that uh, he feels like he finds a big portion of his stories. There was a famous sculpturist, a sculpturer, and I don't remember his name, but he said when he's doing his sculptures and he's t whittling away the rock he says he believes the sculpture's already in there he's just trying to find it david lynch is a filmmaker an artist and after years of doing this his conclusion is highly platonic he just says i believe there's a place where there's a world of ideas and your mind is like a net and you dip your net into this world and you pull out ideas and there's this idea here as well with Wigner that there is some world that's accessible, that's accessible aesthetically, not just, not just problem solving, but getting there through aesthetics um, that helps you ultimately deal with real world issues. How do we explain this? It's utterly fascinating. Now, do we explain it with realism or anti-realism? What's that? Well, realism is when you say 
there's some it's platonic this says there's some place where these there are mathematical artifacts that exist and then anti-realism's idea no the naturalist is going to be an anti-realist they're going to say no these are they're going to be um, highly nominalistic on these things they're going to say no there, there is no such thing as a world where math exists craig says it doesn't matter what your position is because if mathematical objects if you thought they were real if they disappear they have no impact on the world I don't know theologically if that's the case because if you're a realist and you're in you are um, a theist, you might believe that uh, these. Well, I'm not going to get into that. It's a whole other bag of maybe someday, but it has to do with the mind of God and that the mind does have an does have an impact on the universe. So, I mean, and Craig even believes that. So that's something we could talk about another time if, if anyone has any interest. But um, I want to read this article written by John Pockinghorn about the effectiveness, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Zany. Zany. Um, unreasonable effectiveness. If someone hasn't been watching any of my videos, I apologize if that came off. You got to know, though, it is important that this is zany. If you're watching this, and this this isn't coming off as zany in any way, shape, or form, you're, you're out of the loop. You're out of the loop. So you need to get with it. It just shows that you may have lack of zane in your life, and you need a little more of it. So this is uh, John Pockinghorn. It's really interesting. Derek once said that it is more important to have beauty in your equations than to have them fit experiment. Of course, he did not mean that empirical adequacy was ultimately dispensable. No physicist would think that. If you have solved the equations of your new theory and found that the answers did not appear to agree with experiment, that was undoubtedly a setback. However, it was not necessarily absolutely fatal. No doubt you had had to have recourse to some approximation scheme in getting your answer, and maybe you had just made an inappropriate approximation, or maybe the experiments were wrong. We have known that we have known that happen more than once in physics, so there could still be at least a residual degree of hope, but if your equations were ugly, there was no hope. The whole history of physics testified against them. Fascinating. So I think that what's what's going on in the background, it's never said explicitly because there wasn't time. What's going on in the background of Oppie's thinking here is that given evolutionary assumptions, he does not bring up evolution at all. It's just a reality of naturalism. The human mind is a brain. The brain has extension, not the mind. So, in aesthetics are merely a chemical construct of the brain. So, there's no reason to think that striving for beauty in mathematics would lead to real-world physical results. And I think that's why he kind of focused and honed in on, hey, you know, I don't think the, the beauty here is the driving force, but rather problem solving. And I would say that is reductionistic. Actually, it's it's definitely both. Um, I, links in the description. I'll put the debate. I'll put uh, the book that I just read out of. Uh, and then um, I'll also put a link to an article, I'm sorry, a video uh, from a well-dressed, oddly dressed, zany dressed, French mathematician who teaches children and he does what's called uh, magic squares. Really interesting. But he just thinks that if you did math for maths, just, just for problem solving, uh, for just raw numbers, that it, it's, to, it's not enough. That's not why he did, he did math for the joy of doing math and there's a beauty to it. And the, the, the video is beauty versus utility. I don't believe that it is beauty versus utility, though. I think you need both. And But the beauty element cannot be dispensed. Graham Oppie may not have a problem with that if he really thought about it. I'm not sure. He might come around and say, oh, okay, well, maybe there is a 
you know, he may have a defense to all this, but I'm I'm not perceiving what it would be given naturalistic assumptions. 